like angry wailing ancestors screeching, shame on you for leaving China. I know! My six teenagers as they clung to their ship that was rocked and pummeled by giant waves. We passed up sun. Turn north, turn north. Current too strong, uh, wind's too strong. Sails, turn the sails, pull the rudder. Oh, 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 oh. Suddenly, oh. Oh. two women dashed below to, to kneel before that red altar. Jin Hao, Kuan Yin, please, please spare us. Honorable, honorable ancestors, save our lives, please. We will bring honor to our family name in the in the new home. You will see if you will only you will only guide us to safety. Suddenly, oh! Oh! Dragon Kingdom is dying. Ah! It was eighteen fifty. And news of gold paving the streets of Gansan. Gold Mountain, the Chinese name for San Francisco, had arrived in China the previous year. And to many towns, villages along the Pearl River Delta region of southern China, America was a huge opportunity to lift oneself out of poverty. With famine, civil unrest, typhoid fever, and the Taiping rebellions turning their country into bloody killing fields. What did they have to lose? Even with stories of danger that drifted back across the sea that separated China from California, many did return, didn't they? And with gold and pockets full of money. In one small village, six teenagers dreamt of returning home to China with pockets full of money. But not from gold. From, from fish. Well, they had been fishing with their families and small fishing villages since the moment they could walk, and by the many generations before them. And so the Chinese in America would want Chinese food, but they would bring not just any food, but salt, salt to dry fish. fish. The Chinese love fish, and the gold mines were high up in the foothills of the Sierras, far from the sea. You see, so many. We will return to our village with a fortune, and, and, and we will return with presents for everyone. Oh, no, not too far away, Kong Po. When we were matched and we were married, it was not to leave everything and everyone we know. Well, you're not leaving me, and I'm not leaving you. We will be together. Too dangerous. I will protect you. No, no, no. It's better if I just stay here and take care of your mother. <laughs> No, I don't want to be just another Gansan widow, growing old in bed, waiting for you to return children without a father. Uh, uh, children? Talk of children already? Uh, uh, how many do you want? Mm. <laughs> no, you see, we will raise our children in a new home. America. Uh, yeah. You will be by my side. It's your promise and your duty. And your chance, too. And so, one spring morning in 1850, Kwok Mo and his new wife, So May, and another teen couple and two young teenage men left home and began a new life. They first made passage to the Philippines, where they bought a 60-foot junk boat, using most of the combined family savings and family associations in their village. The Philippines, still controlled by Spain, was known for its trade with Acapulco, sailing on the Manila Spanish galleons. These huge Spanish ships were modeled after the well-made Chinese junk boat design. And so, of course, the Filipinos and the Chinese had been building these ships for the, the Spanish for centuries. And because they also traveled with them to the Americas, these merchants and sailors knew all about the tides, the best times, and the most favored route Sale. You know way no current. <laughs> the old merchant smiled at the teens. Round spectacles balanced on the tip of his nose. Uh, way no current go round and round like a wheel. Uh, it, it, it goes east to west, 
then south and back up north again to Philippines. Ah, his voice was as crusty as an old rusty hymn. Uh, wait, look, Kurt, we'll take you all the way to Gomsan. Gold Mountain, San Francisco. Easy, easy. First, you must sail north uh, past Japan, or stop Japan, and uh, get some supplies there. Oh, Japan has good food? No, pretty much food, but not as good as Chinese. <laughs> Then <laughs> you 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 uh, you curve, curve east into Pacific Ocean. Uh, there's some islands along the way too. You you stop getting more supplies. Then uh, you pick up the trade winds, go east, and then you catch whale or current again. Go south all the way to California coast. That uh, journey takes you three, maybe four months. Four months. Oh, oh, oh. Good weather, good winds, and no problem. Yeah, maybe three months. <laughs> but be careful, though. When you get close to Gopsan, the coast is very rocky, very foggy, very dangerous. No, 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 no. You, you don't pass Gopsan, or you go all the way to Mexico. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, 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 now the marketplace. Oh, look, oh, oh. Uh, how many? Oh, well, how many eggs you want to eat each day? Oh, six of us. Uh, I'll get four hens, one rooster, two ducks, and a goat for milk. Yes, uh, oh, right. Parko smiled. So maybe it was petite, but it should be an interesting challenge. He liked her spirit, her sturdiness, even her big feet. But no bound feet for him. No, he liked having a partner, not a plaything for a wife. And he found himself attracted to her and had grown to love her in ways that he had not even imagined was possible. He especially liked to watch her each evening as she would untie the hair bones on both sides of her head and watch the hair fall down like water upon her shoulders. And now they would share an adventure together. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, uh, uh, uh. Dried meat, uh, shrimp, shrimp. Uh, pork, pork, and squid. Ah, cool. Where's the preserved fruit? Uh, pickled vegetable. Uh, oh, there, there, there. Oh, there. and we need fresh fruit and feed for the livestock. Oh, I'll get it. Okay. Oh, so May smiled as she watched her young husband gather supplies with a pride she could not name. He was different than all the other men in her village. He was, he was open. He, he was not afraid to talk dreams. And he seemed to like her. Her mother used to scold her. Aya, hoa, sasao, chachana, sasuna. But here she was saying anything she wanted. He didn't seem to mind. So she decided she liked him too. He was a little skinny, but she would cook for him, fatten him up, and make him into a lopsa, a garbage pail. They can eat all leftovers. And she thought his bushy eyebrows and his big ears were cute. It would be a good adventure. Soon, two large barrels of rice scattered and four barrels of fresh water, and plenty of cold briquettes for cooking. All the supplies were stored aboard the ship. And as they were fishermen, they could catch fresh fish for dinner each night. But treasured most was the red altar that their families had bought for them together for their children. With all the stories of, of murder and, and, and riots against the Chinese in this foreign devil land, the altar could at least help ensure their, their survival, bring them good luck and good fortune. How else were they able to protect their sons and daughters? The altar was a simple wooden box. Simple box, painted good luck red. It was about two, two feet tall and two and a half feet wide and one foot deep. Where they would have a bowl for burning incense and a plate for offerings. Good luck red, it was painted and it was framed in a gold painted lattice to welcome abundance. Tiny red tassels hung from its curled roof. A picture of Tin Hao, the goddess of the sea of sailing and good fortune, was pasted to the back wall. The drawer below held a box of matches, incense sticks, wax candles, and rolled up pictures of other deities for their new home. As the teens approached the red altar, they remembered their homes and the families they were leaving behind. 
The cheerful goodbyes, sobbing. They offered a bowl of rice and a plate of kumquats and oranges to the goddess of the sea, Tin Hao, and, and offered uh, incense, with incense bowl of Kuan Yin, the goddess of mercy. Of course, they hoped for their safety, but even more important, they hoped that someday, one day, somehow, they would return to see their families again. Xiao Lei. Xiao Lei. Xiao Lei. Xiao Lei. Let's go. Let's go. And so 16 years just climb to their stations, and soon the wind billowed with sails, and the junk boat began its journey into the wide open sea aimed at opportunity. That morning, five other Chinese junk boats joined their their little armada. On that spring morning, they left the shores of the Philippines in that spring morning of 1850. But now, three months later, only three boats remained in sight. Of the three remaining, one stopped off at an island, perhaps, perhaps off the coast of Canada. And another one landed on a beach far north of San Francisco in a place called Cascade Beach, a land of giant trees in Mendocino, a town just getting started. As for their own boat, it was blown past Gongsan, past San Francisco by an unexpected and unseasonable storm. Now the wave of current pushed them unmercifully south toward San Diego and, and, and Mexico. Tired and, and cold, still from head to toe for day, they battled for their lives. shards of broken bowls, bits of wood, seashells, and seaweed. Several chickens clucked about, pecking at the sand. A duck waddled through the foamy brine, and a lone goat stood vigil over six bodies sprawling in the sand, their water so close clinging, and their black hair spreading out like fingers reaching towards land. Suddenly, Footsteps padded on wet sand toward the six bodies. Oh, Rosario, what do we have here? Taguchi, uh, are they alive? Rosario and Taguchi were the excellent nation of Monterey County. They originally lived along the Pacific coast and the Carmel River that opened up into the ocean. But now, they have converted to Catholicism and lived along the Carmel River inland, just inland from that bay. And they worked for the Mexican ranchers as seamstresses and cooks and as ranch hands. And some were indentured slaves. Tiburcio's group was free, and they had walked to the Carmel Bay to fish and to gather sea treasures that certainly were washed ashore by the storm the night before. But this storm brought something quite out of the ordinary. They knelt by the six bodies. Oh, they're burning up. The cold has made them sick. Quick, take to the point, Lobos. The, the trees will protect them from the winds. Build a fire. And so the Esselin carried the six bodies up to the cliff above Carmel Bay. They stripped them of their wet clothes. They covered them with warm blankets. And then they 
kindness of the way to retrieve the junk boat's floating pots and baskets and barrels and a strange red box. In the next few weeks, the Esselin nursed the Chinese back to health and began teaching the ways of the land, how to hunt, where to look for local plants such as the artichoke. <laughs> Two different languages did not keep these groups from bonding. They were like family in more ways than one. Now living in a land hostile to red, black, and yellow skin, they would be linked together in camaraderie, in, in protection and in friendship for many years to come. They traded techniques in fish and for both groups knew a great deal about fishing. But whereas the Esalen fished for only what they needed at any one time to feed themselves, the Chinese saw a vast opportunity. From where the Carmel River flowed into the Carmel Bay, there was not one fishing boat. And in the deep waters beyond in the wide open seas, there was not one fishing boat. So when they fully recovered, two of the men built cabins on Point Globals, and the other two fashioned uh, boats, small boats out of redwood, two flat bottomed sawn sampans like the kind used back home in China. And then they fashioned long poles to push the boats through the shallow bay until they were deep enough so the paddle that was in the back of the sampan could drive them out to deeper waters. The women found a perfect place for the red altar, and then they began to repair the fish nets and the fishing boat that had washed the shore. Mm -hmm. I dream of them true. We can sell fish to the Mexican ranchers who live far away from the coast of the hills. Mr. San Francisco, only three days by working wagon. You know, we then have been talking. We can sell the dry fish and have it shipped back to China. <gasps> We're the rich. Only we and his uh, and and the I read the Esalen uh, fish tank water is <laughs> so much fish. Didn't I tell you it's turned out good? Mm, fish bring more money than gold. Oh, tell you, don't you, don't you, Dragon don't you? Thank you. And so it was in 1850 that these six teenagers started the fishing industry in Carmel Bay, which would eventually expand around the coast to Monterey and the Pacific Road. They found the waters rich for cod and halibut. Um, yellowtail, and uh, flounder. And bluefish and redfish. Sardines. Squid and shark. Oysters, mussels, and especially abalone. They worked hard and they worked long, from sun up to sun down, and it paid off. Soon their tiny cabins were furnished with chairs and, and cabinets and, and tables. They found a perfect setting on Point Lotus. Yes, they go high on a cliff overlooking the beautiful blue ocean and the rocky coast. Often they would sit there and gaze out across the great blue west towards China. Oh, I like it here. It's so quiet and beautiful. It looks so much like home. So much water. Oh, they even have dolphins here, like in the Delta. Mm -hmm. And you know we're the best. <laughs> we are our own business. We we uh, we reinvest in our own uh, businesses. We we make our own business decisions, and we keep a share of the profit. And we even have enough to send home to our families, to to our parents. <coughs> and it's safe here, not like in the gold mines with all the robberies and murder. Mm, we're so lucky to have crashed here. Oh, what was that proverb that our parents always said to us? <coughs> oh, <laughs> curse your wife in the evening, sleep alone at night. No, oh, what you cannot avoid, welcome. Uh, close, close, but no. We crashed here. It, we thought it was bad, and it turned out good. Did our parents say that? No, but I'm only saying that so we could find the right proper. Oh. oh, never mind. Oh. You know what I mean. Yes, I'm, I'm lucky we got number 10. No, 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 that's not it. Huh? You know, amongst 10 matchmakers, nine will lie. <laughs> we got lucky, and I got you. <laughs> number 10. Uh, oh, uh, you're crazy. I'm crazy about you. Oh, <laughs> I remember. It's the word about the horse. Horse. Mm. Oh, oh yes, yeah, of course. Uh, uh -huh. in in say, oh. A lost horse can turn into a blessing. That's it. <laughs> oh. well, so, 
Am I still under 10 to you? Two? No, no, you're a crazy wife. <laughs> <laughs> Though all Chinese in America were forbidden by law to own property, they could rent the land and build. And so, in 1853, just three years after they landed and crashed on the shores, <coughs> they welcomed five to 600 fellow Chinese and were selling to 800 salted dried fish. Half was sent back to China, and the other half was sent to uh, towns up north in San Francisco and New York. And once in towns like San Francisco, the merchants would sell and send to the various Chinese communities throughout California, such as the mines in the Sierras, and the logging camps in Mendocino, the, the uh, agricultural and the uh, uh, railroad communities. <coughs> Soon the word spread about the abundance and the, and the opportunity to be made by fishing the good waters of Carmel and Monterey. And since there was less trouble for the Chinese, no robberies, no murders, they flooded in from all the communities throughout the West Coast. Even from China. There was enough fish to, for everyone if they were smart about it. And they were. When they noticed one fish was declining in numbers, they would stop fishing that species for an entire season. The years went by. The years were good to them. But something was missing. Awful. These same waters touch China, don't they? Why are you sad? Because I miss my family. Mm, I miss them too. Well, then maybe it's time. We can go back to China? Uh, no, maybe it's time we uh, make our own. Oh, uh, you, you mean? Mm -hmm. You think? Mm -hmm. You're sure? I'm sure. That night. <laughs> They lit special incense at the red altar and prayed to the fertility goddess, Kuan And then they scurried up to the Joss house, where again they lit incense for Kuan Yin. Is this auspicious time to, uh, to have a baby or go back to China? And then they consulted the bamboo fortune six. They shook a bamboo container. One of the sticks would come forth. And then, the question book. 35. 35. Uh, oh, 35. Uh, uh, when luck visits you, everyone knows where you live. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's do it again. <laughs> Is this a special time to have a baby or go back to China? Are you going to go back to China? Are you going to go back Stand by the water and long for fish. Go home and, and weave a net. Nine months later. Not a hope for a son, but our daughter is healthy. Ah, it was 1859, nine long years after they had arrived and gone half across the world to California that they gave birth to perhaps the very first Chinese girl born in the American West. They named her simply Kwok Moy, girl belonging to the Kwok family. Kwok Moy was a very special little girl. For at age four, she of course she could speak Chinese, but as she played with the Esalen children, she learned their language, Brumskin, as well. And at five, she began her education at the one room red missionary school and when she walked to school with her English missionary teacher her English expanded. Of course the school she played with the Spanish and Portuguese speaking children and each day she learned more and more of each language so by the time she was eight years old she was fluent in all five languages. Ramsian, Portuguese, English, Spanish and of course Chinese. But because the land had been colonized by the Spaniards for centuries, and then later they granted the land and their ranches to Mexico. Spanish was the common language outside of the Chinese fishing villages. And so for Kwok Moy, she used her Spanish the most because 
when she left town, when she left her village, she was there in town speaking Spanish. Well, Moira would become the interpreter and the translator for all the Chinese business transactions. Now, to her parents, she was still known as Wang Moi. But to everyone else outside the village, she was given a nickname, Maria Española, Spanish Mary. She was Chinese. She looked Chinese. Of course, she was Chinese, but everyone called her Spanish Mary. Vamanos, vamanos, let's go, mi amigo! Oh, one moment she was running down the beach chasing after a wave, and the next moment climbing up a tree. Laila, Laila, come, come, hurry! Spanish Mary was a tomboy. She was small, but muscular, and with a fierce look in her eyes. Her face was usually dirty, and her hair and her shoes were always filled with sand. She had a smell of the sea, the salty sea, and she rarely stood still. She waited for no one, and she was friends with everyone. But all too soon. Quack Moy, you are nine years old now. Time to help the family. No more school. Big girl. And so she began to work, learning to tie the strings to make the fish nets. Also learned to collect the seaweed and spread them out on the rocks to dry. She also helped to scale the fish. Chow you. <laughs> to get them. Chow you. And to salt them. Chow you. you. <laughs> and also to hang them up on the racks. Well, the smelly fish were hung on racks everywhere, strewn all about on the beach, on the fields, even on poles hanging from houses. In fact, depending on where the wind was coming from, Carmel, the sort of grove in Monterey, smelled of dead, stinky fish. In fact, Monterey was known as the Stinky City. Ciao, yo. Ciao, you. Each year, the Chinese community grew larger and larger. And more, there were more and more men coming into the community, and more and more boats began to dock the Carmel and Monterey Bays. So, by 1868, two new fishing villages were sprung up. The Pescadero Fishing Village, situated west of where now the famous Pebble Beach Golf Course is, and Pantalona's <coughs> Village, where on the north end sits the Cannery Rose Monterey Bay Area uh, Aquarium, all the way down to the Stanford Marina on the south end. To Spanish Mary. The more men there were, the more men there were to make that dancing dragon longer and longer at the Chinese New Year's parade. And now she was also the big sister of her two, uh, her younger brother, Tak Lee, and her little, little sister, Sing Hing. Baba? Mama? When are we going to the parade? <laughs> yeah. You finished folding those tinfoil ornaments first. Mama, I already finished it yesterday. I've made the, the, the good luck sign with Mama. Now it's your turn to put it on the door. Yeah. And I get Silo little brother ready and, and Mama little sister ready. And then we go to the parade. <laughs> yeah, bossy girl. <laughs> oh, sa sa chan chan. You're sassy like your Mama. That's <laughs> from my Baba. <laughs> the Spanish Mary. The more men there were, the more and more men there were to bring also. I see. Special red envelopes. Build of coins for buying candy. Baba, in China, do the women and the, and the girls get to be in the dragon dance? Oh, women do such a thing? No, no. Too embarrassing for women, huh? Not for me. Baba, do, do you think the low fun, the, the white people want to see such a thing? No! See women jump around like that? Oh, boy, you, you're crazy. Oh, Baba, look at how they enjoy our New Year's celebration. They laugh and they, and they don't be so mean to us. Baba, is it true that on Saturday nights, the cowboys come to the village and lasso the men and, and cut off their cue? When did you see that? Uh, who told you that? Mm. By now. Late 1860s, European immigrants were coming in and, and dominating the, the local politics and culture of Monterey. They began setting new conditions and new rules for living in the area. Clark Moy began to hear strange words being tossed at the Chinese. Stupid. Filthy. Evil. <laughs> Inferior. Yellow peril. Dregs of society. Clark Moy didn't even know what most of those words meant. But when she saw their faces contort with hate, and then they would spit on the Chinese, 
There's no question what they were feeling. Good boy, you must always be alert. You always like the incense to Tuki, the god who protect us from ghosts and beggars and bandits and dangerous strangers. Yes, Baba. But Baba, ba why? Why do the strangers come to our celebration if they don't like us? Because it's free! <laughs> uh, you see how the little farm, they grab at our candy by the, by the fistfuls and shove it into their mouths? No, no, no. Those little farm are not like our little farm white people friends. No, don't be confused. What looks the same is not always the same. Today, Kwok Moy was looking around trying to see which little farms were the good ones and which were the bad ones. This dilemma was still in her mind when the next year she was old enough to leave the village and go to the big city without her parents. She was not only old enough, she was strong enough to sell fish in Monterey. <laughs> Hawk Moy blew on her tin horn to attract attention. Along with her brother, Dirk Lee. They would carry shoulder poles balanced on their shoulders and fresh fish in baskets hanging from each end of the poles. Then, using a knife and a cutting board she wore around her neck, she would quickly and efficiently scale the fish and then cut it and then present it to each customer. Pescado a la venta, fish for sale. Then she would take out a newspaper, shake it out, and wrap each fish. The Chinese must go. Oh, I wonder what, I wonder where. Huh. Ah, ah, Lin Han, uh, for you, uh, gracias. Each time she would enter the city, she marveled at all the other doings in town. She, she stared at all the strange people, their strange clothes, all the other kinds of buildings and all the other kind of strange smells. But best of all, she always bought her New Year's uh, money to buy candy at the general store. Hola, mi amigos. Hola, hola. Oh, time for los dulces, some mm. candy? Si, si, senor. I saw all the de mar fish. Oh, I forgot to save some for you. No <laughs> oh, problema. Mañana, mañana. No, no. Eh. Que los dulces para usted y hermano pequeño. Oh, what kind of candy for you and your little brother? Caramelo. Ah, sí, caramelo. Muy bien, opción. Oh, the merchants outside of Chinatown love selling to the Chinese because they always use cash, not like the other groups that had long IOUs. Suddenly, a group of boys ran up from behind Spanish, Spanish Mary and her brother, and they grabbed the candy out of her hands and kicked and pulled and it started stomping on the baskets. Chinaman, Chinaman, the Chinese must go. Haven't you heard, Chink? New law in the city. No poles in our city. My pa says, you should all go back to where you came from. China, you chink. No, but I was born here. Chinaman, Chinaman, the Chinese must go. We were born the Chinese here. must go. We were the born Chinese here. must go. The Chinese must go. I cannot must stop this. Leave these children alone. I cannot go. Oh, oh, and Huckley ran as fast as they could away from the city, tears streaming down their faces. She didn't notice that the old family friends, Rosari and Tibuccio, would sit there and sigh, and shake their heads. Once Huckley was safe in her village, she lit incense to, to, to tea, the, the god of protection, and then she walked down to the ocean to calm down. As she looked across the waters, on the horizon, she saw the gathering of dark, Storm was brewing.